So here's a question. What are curved arrows good for, really? I mean, are they useful for anything aside from pretty pictures drawn on paper that chemists use to amuse and amaze their friends? Well, the answer, thankfully, is yes. They're more than just intellectual curiosity. In fact, they drive the rational development of reactions, and they've done so for probably the past 50 years plus. Organic reaction mechanisms and curved arrows, which are the building blocks of those mechanisms, allow chemists to make reasonable hypotheses about how reactions work and then develop reactions based on those hypotheses. In this video, we'll take a look at a couple of examples, but the foundational idea is that the hypothesis about how the reaction works at the molecular level, at the extremely micro scale level of two or three molecules coming together, tells us also how the reaction works at the macroscopic level. So the reaction run on a liter scale is just that molecular level event happening billions upon billions of times. And so to control the reaction, all we need to understand is how the molecular level event works. This has proven true time and time again, and it's one of the most amazing discoveries of modern organic chemistry, that molecular level details, extremely microscopic, small-scale events that we can't see, can be used and understood to control large-scale chemical reactions. A classic example of a reaction whose development was driven by mechanistic considerations and hypotheses is the electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, and I'd like to start off with that as the primary example of this video. Electrophilic aromatic substitution is the reaction of an aromatic compound with an electrophile. To give you a sort of classic example of this process, if we take the compound benzene and we treat it with a Lewis acid such as iron chloride in the presence of chlorine, what we'll end up with when it's all said and done, is chlorobenzene, where a chlorine atom has replaced a hydrogen in the benzene ring. Now, the mechanism of this process involves multiple steps involving electron flow. And a, an important characteristic of organic reactions that you should know before thinking about mechanistic hypotheses is that the most easy to understand and, and study reactions are characterized by a single step that is the slow step. We call that the rate determining step or RDS. And what's neat about the rate determining step is that changes that we make in the rate determining step in terms of the stability and structure of the compounds involved has a large effect on the overall rate and yield of the reaction in question. So if we make structural modifications that speed up the RDS, we speed up the entire reaction overall, and vice versa. The other steps matter much less. Now, in the context of electrophilic aromatic substitution, the key rate determining step is the attack, as it's called, of the aromatic compound on an adduct of chlorine with the Lewis acid, which looks like this. You should take a moment to see if you can guess or determine what the source and sink here are. Hopefully, after looking at these curved arrows, you're able to come to the conclusion that this is a pi to sigma star kind of orbital interaction. And the resulting product has established that key carbon-chlorine bond in the following intermediate. Now, why is it nice to know that this is the rate determining step? Well, as it happens, benzene, compared to some compounds, is relatively sluggish in this reaction of electrophilic aromatic substitution, and it's highly dependent on the nature of the Lewis acid. And in fact, even having that Lewis acid, that iron chloride around, is kind of a pain in the butt. So in thinking about substrates that might speed this reaction up, we need look no further than the curved arrows in the rate determining step in order to figure this out. Here's the fundamental idea. If we can make the electron source, the pi bond, a better source somehow. If we can make that a better electron source, then we can speed up the reaction. Similarly, if we can make the electron sink a better sink, we can also speed up the reaction. So let's start from the, the idea that we can't really touch the Lewis acid. We don't want to mess with the Lewis acid. It's not organic, and so it's outside of our scope. But the electron source 
is organic. It's the aromatic compound. It's the benzene. So how can we tweak the benzene to make it a better electron source? Well, imagine if in the intermediate that follows this key step, there was a group attached that stabilized the positive charge. Such a group, in order to stabilize the positive charge by resonance, would just need a lone pair associated with it that could donate back to the positive charge like so. Let's just throw an R group in there to abbreviate it. And then the resonance shows us that the positive charge in the intermediate is spread out. And this is a good thing, right, for the stability of the intermediate, that its positive charge is spread out over multiple atoms. And both of these would, of course, have chlorines in them at this stage. So tacking on a group that has a lone pair onto one of the carbons of the benzene ring should speed the reaction up. And unsurprisingly, substrates like aniline, which possesses a nitrogen attached to the benzene ring, and anisole, which possesses an oxygen attached to the benzene ring, are both more rapid at electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions than the parent compound benzene. This was a mechanistically driven discovery. If we didn't know that the rate determining step looked like this, we wouldn't have been able to predict from first principles that these compounds containing what are called electron donating groups, an electron donating group just has a lone pair that it can donate in. If we didn't know that the rate determining step looked like this, then we wouldn't know that the electron donating groups on the benzene ring should speed the reaction up. And in fact, the flip side is also true. So imagine we tacked on a group onto the benzene ring that actually destabilized the positive charge. We could do this by attaching a group to the benzene ring for which resonance was important, such as a carbonyl, which would put two large positive charges in close proximity in that intermediate. So in this hypothetical compound, which contains this pendant carbonyl group, there is a resonance structure that has some sizable importance with two positive charges next to one another. This indicates that the intermediate might have some issues and suggests to us that the rate determining step of electrophilic aromatic substitution of this compound ought to be quite a bit slower than the rate determining step for benzene or anisole or aniline. And indeed, that's observed in practice. Perhaps the most famous example of this is the nitro group, which in fact possesses a positively charged group adjacent to the benzene ring. That's going to introduce big problems in the rate determining step, and so this compound is quite slow at electrophilic aromatic substitution. That conclusion was 100% mechanism driven. By understanding the nature of the rate determining step in terms of its electron flow, and more specifically, recognizing the electron source and sink, and even more specifically, recognizing the source as a pi bond in the benzene ring, we were able to conclude that compounds containing electron donating groups, such as aniline and anisole, should react more rapidly and should give better yields than compounds bearing electron withdrawing groups like nitro and aldehyde.